Hey everybody, this is Ethan Evans. I'm the Easy Coach, and we're live here today with a special guest. This is Bilal. Is it Bilal? Bilal? How? What's the right pronunciation um, yeah. for your the name? The first way, yeah, the first way was Bilal. right. Yeah, okay, that's there what I go. figured. Sweet. And he's a student at the University of Waterloo, actually in a program I know really well. Hmm, my microphone's giving me fits. Nothing like starting with a little tech, tech <laughs> joy. It's my headphones cutting in and out. That's okay, though. Uh, I can hear you. He can hear me. Uh, audio levels should be good. Uh, hydrate's wondering if I'm drinking water. Uh, I'm two fisting it. Um, I have a cold, and so y'all may see the handy dandy Kleenex come out at some point uh, this evening. So I'm I'm drinking everything I can. <clears throat> no comment on everything I can. Uh, all right, and my headphones are apparently going to drive me nuts. Ah, uh, seriously. Okay, let's see if that's better. The noise cancellations cutting in and out. Oh no. Really frustrating me. We'll give it one more try. All right, so I don't want to distract from it though. Tonight's agenda is we're gonna do a live mock interview and Bilal has volunteered to step up and be interviewed. So we just posted his updated resume in the general chat section of our Discord server. So if you wanna see it there, you can. I'm gonna put it up over my face here for just a minute. Uh, I had blown up the other one. He just updated it. So I got to zoom this in. Give me one second. Um, so there's uh, his resume um, up top. I know a lot of viewers on this stream are just starting their careers. And so it's a good chance for uh, you to see someone interview who's looking for an internship. And um, so uh, just to give you a quick description of Bilal's school, he's in a special program at the University of Waterloo here at the bottom where they take five years to get to graduation, which has to seem like eternity. Oh um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but they also <laughs> do, what is it? Four internship semesters, co-ops? How many co-ops? Six internships, Six. so that's 24 months of yeah, internships. 24 months of co-ops, so that's brutal. And as someone who's hired a lot of people out of the University of Waterloo, um, uh, this microphone is gonna just really frustrate me tonight. So we're gonna do a little microphone repair here on the fly. Um, as someone who's hired a lot of people from the University of Waterloo, they're fantastic. So I'm gonna pull this down. You can see it on our Discord, uh, but we've hired a lot of people out of University of Waterloo. It's a good program. But this will give a chance for all of you who are looking for your start to see how I would interview someone. And what we're gonna do is we're going to assume that Bilal is applying for a position um, <clears throat> uh, applying for a position at Twitch. And so I'm gonna interview him like I was interviewing for Twitch. That's what he wanted. I offered him that, I offered him Amazon, I offered him Amazon AWS. Uh, he chose Twitch. Um, <clears throat> just a couple comments before we start. As you always know, uh, I'm on stream speaking only as myself. I'm not actually representing Twitch in this context, nor Amazon. Um, oh, and we do have the Q&A widget active. You can feel free to put in questions for us, but we're gonna hold them all until the end. So we're not actually going to take questions until the end of the interview. Um, and so at the end of the interview, uh, then we'll see what questions you have about interviewing and I'm happy to answer them, but we're gonna hold those to the end. Uh, okay, so with that said, uh, that should be everything. Let's jump in. I'm gonna go into character as it were, and we're gonna interview. Uh, so let's see, Bilal, it's a real pleasure to meet you here today. I'm glad you came in. Um, so you're interested in Twitch. Tell me a little bit, do you watch Twitch? Yeah, um, I, I guess was introduced to Twitch a long time ago. Being a gamer, I like followed Justin TV back when it came out, however many years ago now. Um, and I still continuously watch Twitch a lot today. I think it's a really cool platform because um, although it hasn't really innovated much um, recently, but with the new competition coming in with YouTube and uh, other platforms, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for Twitch to differentiate itself and make it better. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys are doing there. Awesome. So uh, when you uh, watch Twitch, um, What's uh, what's something on Twitch you think can be better? Like when you use Twitch, uh, what would you improve if you could? If you were the CEO, uh, what would you change? 
Yeah, um, I guess there's a business aspect of Twitch, which from my understanding is a big problem currently. Uh, the way YouTube works in terms of advertisers is that they have different advertiser tiers uh, that lets them monetize content creators differently. So different uh, maturity levels have different kinds of ratings. And that's a good way for Twitch to, or for YouTube to monetize itself. Twitch has this problem where it doesn't do that kind of distinction. As a result, from my understanding, in the culture of Twitch streamers, there is kind of this concern that uh, like monetize, monetization is um, not so great for them in many areas. A lot of the bans that happen to them are kind of a result of this in some way. So that's one kind of business related thing I would change. Uh, in terms of like technical side, I think one thing I would change is that it seems like the streaming quality is a lot higher on YouTube. I'm not sure if that's something that you guys are doing intentionally because of the cost, but I might look into that too. Got it. So if you were CEO, you'd look at the business model, you'd change the streaming costs, a uh, bunch of good suggestions. So what I'm, how I'm going to do this interview is after he gives his answers, I'm going to critique them and give a little commentary so that everyone gets that benefit. So the first thing is don't be completely suckered in by an icebreaker. So uh, I asked him an icebreaker, which was truthful, which is, oh, you use Twitch. That's interesting. Uh, tell me more about it. And then he volunteered that he's been using Twitch uh, going all the way back to when it was Justin TV. So he's basically announcing, hey, I know Twitch really well. And so if you know Twitch really well, then it's fair game for me to ask you what you think about it. Um, <clears throat> so on the plus side, always be prepared and know something about your company that you're applying to. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, Second, um, you want to uh, you want to have an answer uh, with some depth. You want to be able to really talk about the company and why you're interested in it. Ah, uh, this microphone hates me tonight. I've never had this problem with it. Uh, I'm gonna kill the noise canceling. All right. So um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, so we'll move on from that. And chat, you're always free to comment. Uh, coaches mic level seems low. Well, I can fix that. It's probably because I'm not leaning in, uh, but that is fixable there. Thank you. Is that better? Uh, and I can bring it in closer. Thank you Deflex. I appreciate the feedback. I should be louder now. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. So jumping in then, um, what I was going for there is trying to figure out culture fit and also his level of prep and diligence. So he kind of announced in a great way that he fits the culture. If he goes all the way back to Justin TV, uh, you know, that's seven, eight years ago. Twitch happens to really like people that are gamers. Now, that isn't a qualification, but obviously from a culture fit, somebody who knows the space is going to be really highly valued. Um, so we'll go on, though. Now we'll go to some uh, harder questions. So my next question, Bilal, is what's, what's the last technical thing you learned in any context, at work, in school? What would you say is the last significant technical topic you learned? Um, give me a moment so I can give you a thoughtful answer. That's good, by the way. Don't be afraid to buy time. Like, you don't just want to shoot off the hip. So... Recently, I was working on AWS for my uh, one of my uh, like side projects I do, I guess, on the side. And for that, I was trying to configure like deployments and auto scaling and so on. And so that was something I hadn't ever done before. One thing I really like found interesting was just the level of automation that's been done on that end. So you can completely configure load balancing on say, like several config parameters. Um, and working on that, I realized that infrastructure is kind of a really complicated thing and that having like a dedicated section of people to specialize in that is really important. Um, so I guess I've learned how big of a field that can be infrastructure wise. Okay. So when you were learning about AWS, tell me a little bit, how did you go about learning it? How do you, how do you learn? How do you teach yourself? Sure. Um, so there's two resources I primarily went to. Um, I'm going to be frank here. The documentation for AWS is oftentimes, I think, like lacking in many areas. I was really struggling where certain error messages, I think, may have been changed or updated. That was pretty hard to debug. Uh, and so just, uh, and because 
my company was using the free tier of like the AWS support services, we couldn't like email or use the staff. And so the using like the, having to debug ourselves was really tough. Um, and so what I ended up having to do is like go, go on Stack Overflow, ask anyone else who has experience in an infrastructure setup on AWS. Those are mo the most useful, I think. Um, and then just tinkering around. It's a lot of trial and error in my experience for that for AWS. Okay. Excellent. So what I'm getting at there for the audience is tech skills. It's always nice to hire somebody who knows whatever stack or tool you're on, but understanding how somebody learns is really important. So I'm obliquely digging at does Bilal learn um, and what does he learn? How does he learn? How quick does he learn? The second thing he volunteered that is great if you can slip it into an interview answer is that he was working on a side project. In other words, if you look at his resume, he goes to school, he has co-op terms. He also has a company he's working for. But if I understood you right, you were saying this was something you were doing completely independent of both of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, for my yeah, for my dad, I was like doing something. Yeah. OK, so you don't have to. You can end up saying it's for your dad or not. The point is um, it, it speaks well of someone who's going to school and has a job and is still coding. Like that right there is a strong sign that this is someone that, that most companies are going to be interested in, presuming he's any good at it. And we're not gonna get into like a whiteboard code interview here. So for everybody who's joined, I'll take a moment and say, uh, welcome, this is the Easy Coach. Tonight we're doing a live mock interview with our volunteer Bilal. Uh, we'll throw up the Discord link again. His resume is in our general chat and Discord. And uh, if you have questions that you want to ask about interviewing and how to interview well or about this interview, you can ask them in our question and answer widget. And at the end of the mock interview, I'll drop him out of Zoom and take those questions on screen. So we will get to our usual questions, but it'll be 30, 40 minutes. Meanwhile, this is a chance to learn and see somebody else under pressure. And the format we're going to use is I ask him a question, he answers, then I critique the answer. So, so far, by the way, being honest, you're doing very well. And if I were interviewing you, I'd be thinking, okay, a lot of potential here. And then what a lot of interviewers will do is say, how can I kick it up? Like, since he's doing well, how can I press it further? So when you were learning AWS, what did you actually build? Like what were you, then you put in the effort to learn it. How did you use it? Yeah, um, it was a pretty simple database backend and server backend for my dad's uh, website. He's trying to, uh, I guess, make it kind of, it's a simple kind of standard CRUD app that you do, um, you know, a web app, front end, back end. Um, I was using RDS for the, the database. I mean, just making the configuration scripts for that, making um, the CI/CD pipeline for that. That was just kind of interesting stuff to do, um, which helped me learn more about the process. I was just trying to make his uh, the process of him updating his website really autonomous, and uh, yeah, that was just learning that I got from doing that. Okay, so that answer wasn't as good. It wasn't crisp. Like you lost focus. Um, <laughs> to the degree you can, you want to. Um, so. Modern interviewing, uh, generally most interviewers will use this formulation called behavioral interviewing, which is tell me about a time when. Now, I didn't use that, but like tell me about a time when you used AWS or tell me about how you applied that. And what they're looking for is an answer usually in the form of what's called STAR. Let's see if I can remember what STAR is. I'm sure someone in chat can throw it up. Uh, we have some, yeah. some Amazon Situation. interviewers in there. Well, it's situation, situation, task, action, results, I believe. Yeah, so you know STAR, which is good. Yeah, so the situation is you were using AWS to help your dad improve your dad's website. And the task was you were trying to automate it. And the actions you took were use RDS and the results, and you never got to the results. Mm. But you want to kind of be telling a story in that since you know that's how interviewers are trained and what they're looking for, you want to be telling a story in that format. Um, okay. So that's kind of uh, a way to do that. Yes, yeah, star stories. And then chat says, uh, you can be the star of your own story here, right? So that's what you're trying to do. Situation, task, action, results. Thank you, Matt Stickman and everybody else. Uh, T Weirdo 3 as well. 
All right. Awesome. So you're doing well. Um, let's go on. Uh, so tell me about the hardest thing you feel you've ever tried in, in your career, in your life. What's, what's the most challenging thing you've attempted? Just kind of comes from a personal fault of my own that I have in some way. Um, I'm very headstrong. And when I, when I want to do a certain task for the company that I'm working for right now, I was assigned to partner up with someone else who's also very headstrong in that regard. So when we were working together, a problem we discovered was that we kind of wanted to do separate things. And what would end up happening is that due to our lack of communication, I would do something, it would be finished at a certain point, but it wouldn't be to the specification that the other guy wanted. And so as a result, we got really frustrated. And I knew him from outside of school too from before. So uh, it was kind of awkward in some areas. But I think what really like solved the problem for me was just realizing that it was a communication problem. Uh, if I just tell him how I feel, why I'm trying to take a certain approach, I would hopefully convince him to my side or vice versa or make uh, compromises in the middle. And by kind of swallowing my ego and taking that level of communication and being humble in that, in that way, I think it really solved the problem that I had personally. Um, and it ended up being fine. We solved the task perfectly well. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, chat's, of course, observing. Uh, avoid um, talking about difficulties collaborating. It may make uh, people think that you are difficult to work with. However, I disagree with chat in this case. Uh, you know, uh, the Rex here is comma, uh, one of our longtime viewers says, let's see how he turns it around. I think you turned it around fine. You, you, you broke into jail and then you at least broke back out, um, which telling a story, telling it, that story was honest, incredible and believable. And the fact that you talked about learning from it and swallowing your own pride makes it a positive. And in fact, one of the questions I had later was tell me about a time when you had to work with someone difficult. So you've, in a sense, checked off this very common question because people do want to know how you'll work as a team. And uh, by the way, uh, for everyone watching, um, I always tell you, unfortunately, the number one and number two things that influence an interview outcome are appearance and your enthusiasm because people who like, like to work with uh, people that look uh, pleasant to be around and that seem excited. Um, and that's kind of sad because those aren't tangible skills. Um, but beyond that, addressing the fact that you can be cooperative and collaborative is valid. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Ligerbox is, <laughs> is now sure that his humility and appearance will get him any job. Um, so when it comes to teamwork, though, what Amazon has found in many studies is that tech skills are necessary but not sufficient. What really differenti di differentiates people and their performance over time is actually their interpersonal skills. And so though his story started off scary, and maybe you could find a way to reframe it in a way that would be slightly less scary, not calling yourself headstrong, um, you can still frame it as I have very strong convictions and the person I was working with has strong convictions too. And that led to some interaction difficulties. And here's how we resolve those or here's how I work to resolve those. Um, and so it can become a very good story. So I would say you scored well on teamwork and interpersonal skills and also what we call ownership. Um, and on this channel, we've talked before about extreme ownership, the book. But when we talk about ownership in this context, you own the problem. You didn't blame the other guy. And that's huge. Never, never do that. Uh, you, you can't get into blaming other people. Um, so let's go back then, though. I'll, if this had happened in a real interview, I would have pivoted to following up on the interpersonal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and maybe dug into like, uh, where were you disconnecting? But then I would still want to go back and hear about a different type of hard thing. So my question back to you, Bilal, would be, that was a great story. Thank you for sharing it. Can you also tell me a time where something was very challenging on a technical or work level, not just who you were working with? Okay. Yeah. Once again, I'm going to have to talk about my 
headstrong or my very strong convictions that I have. Um, one of the most challenging things I was See, look how fast he learns. Was during my first co-op job. I was a new intern, but I was still very, very, um, I wanted to be very capable looking and very impressive. So one of the tasks I was doing was, I think, way over my head. It was something I should not have been doing without any help. But because of how much I wanted to complete the job by myself and not ask anyone for help, I ended up spending a lot longer than I should have doing it. Near the end of it, doing that task, I ended up just like biting the bullet, talking to my coworker and having him work with me in it. And literally, like I think I was like 20 times more productive during that time because I sought help from him. And so that made me realize a lot that uh, working on something really technical outside of my abilities isn't something to be ashamed of and I should be okay uh, working on it. And you can look up, if you saw my resume, um, it's one of the points under Honeywell. And I can go more in depth into that if you would like. Perhaps, uh, what, what actually made the task challenging? Uh, that's a great story. What, what was the piece that made the, the job really hard? Yeah, um, so the, the particular task was to implement binary serialization for the program. Like to simply put, I'm sure you're very familiar with all these words. All I was trying to do was just to store the entire program state into a binary format. Um, and that actually turned out to be really hard to do in certain cases. There's a lot of like uh, ownership dependencies in C++ that you have to worry about and pointers and making sure you don't make two, two copies of something and overriding stuff. All that stuff was just really complicated. There's a lot of libraries that have already done the groundwork in that area. In that area. Um, and so I, was, I ended up just using one of those later on with the help of my coworker. Um, but even then, there's still a lot of issues with that, for sure. Just C++ coding is very tough, <clears throat> very tough. OK. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. Chat's comment, and I agree, this is Ligerbox, says, hey, uh, be sure to include the specifics. Mm -hmm. um, your answers do sometimes float a little bit more storytelling and definitely hard ass tech interviewers. Uh, I tell a story, I've told it before. Um, uh, when I was interviewing for Amazon 15 years ago, I went and uh, in one of my interviews, I walked in, I was interviewing as a manager and the guy met me at the door and he said, so I hear you're here to interview as a manager. And I said, yes. And he said, well, I don't know anything about that. So we're going to code. And um, it was just like very, you know, abrupt. <clears throat> the point being, you will sometimes deal with people who just want the hard cold facts and being able to recognize what kind of personality, like I've been having a chatty personality. So your answers are good. But if you have someone who's really into the specifics or handing you a whiteboard pen, you want to make sure you hit the details. Um, and uh, the good part, and Kristen says this, is you sound naturally passionate. Your energy comes out. So, all right, let's 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 go on. Um, can you tell me about a time where you uh, failed at something you set out to do? You did your best and, you know, it, you may have fixed it later or whatever, but Bottom line is it really didn't work out the way you planned, at least the first time. Um, sure. Let me give me a few minutes to think or a few seconds to think about that. So I was actually doing a hackathon about a year ago, um, and I really wanted to complete a feature for it. Uh, the feature was to have i'm gonna like, pause text. you okay good sure. you're gonna explain the feature sorry yeah. i thought you were just gonna say <laughs> go ahead yeah the feature was like text to speech functionality for our uh program it was supposed to be like a radio replacement i was trying to make a really nice sounding text to speech using a lot of libraries that have been created by researchers um from the university of edinburgh i believe um and the the problem that i came up against was that like this is a very old piece of technology it's written in C++ with a very specific compiler in mind. Um, I think that the time constraints that were given in the hackathon were not enough to be like trying to build and tinker around with this piece of technology. I ended up like basically spending the first day and a half trying to tinker around with that. And then the last span of time, I ended up using Google Voices APIs just to kind of have a, a poor sounding, but like a, a manageable working text-to-speech software. 
And I think that was uh, the problem because I spent way too much time on something really difficult when I should have been better at time managing, I think. <clears throat> okay. So what would you say you've learned from that that you would take away to uh, your future work? Yeah, I think uh, developing stuff. So having manageable goals, first of all, is something I should have more. Um, I kind of think like, oh, if I work on this and I make X progress in Y time, then I'll be able to finish it by the end. But realistically, stuff isn't so smooth. You run into side uh, into problems. And so having a more uh, realistic goal deadline for myself by a certain time to have something done would be nice, I think. And that is something I actually do implement today. Um, when, it, when it's for assignments, I have uh, Google Calendar alerts to just finish parts of my assignment by certain dates. Um, and then another small part of that would also be just to be realistic, like make sure I know how much time I have, what I can do, and uh, what would be the best use of my time. And I, I think I do apply that with my uh, new time, manage <clears throat> new time management, uh, Google Calendar stuff that I do. Okay. And how did you feel like uh, at the end of that hackathon? What what was your immediate thought? Um. So really, like up until the first three quarters of it, like I was feeling fine. But the moment the the, the judge came in and they're like, "Oh, eight hours left," my heart completely sank. Like the classic procrastinator's feeling. Um, when I was done it, I was kind of ashamed a lot, but then reflecting on it, reflecting on the experience of doing something under a time constraint made me realize that sometimes uh, it's okay to not have things done under time. Like people procrastinate, people don't always do things um, as they anticipated. And so I think I matured from that experience because I reflected on it and uh, changed my view. Okay. So uh, chat now thinks you're a ringer. I will say uh, I, I expected good things from a Waterloo uh, student because it's a great program, hard to get into. It's probably the premier. Uh, if, there's, if there's people from a couple other universities in Canada on here, I'll offend them, but that's okay. It's probably the premier computer science program in Canada. Um, so now uh, I've done- What exactly a does a ringer mean? A ringer. Uh, a ringer means that I brought on someone who is really good, uh, you know, so uh, that I hand selected someone. It's like a plant or a setup. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's but that's very not flattering. true. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, chat's fond of your answers. Uh, and I agree, though. Um, so we've actually cut through a lot of the questions, which means if people in chat uh, have any questions they want to ask about interviewing or that they think I should throw Bilal, you can put them into the Q&A widget and we'll go see about them. But I have a couple more for him. So my next question for you, Bilal, is honestly, I need to know, are you a Senators or a Maple Leaf fan? <laughs> I don't follow sports at all. I don't know what those teams are. I'm sorry. <laughs> So the, the point of this question is the Senators are the closest hockey team to uh, Waterloo and uh, the Maple oh. Leafs are down in Toronto nearby. Uh, but the real point is you as a candidate, you need to uh, get uh, <laughs> Devin's throwing you out. You're done. He just sank you. Hey, Devin, it's good to see you here. Um, so the point is. You need to be ready for questions that are off the beaten track uh, and how to handle them with decorum. And I think you handle that one fine by just saying, oh, that's not my thing. But um, interviewers go all over the place. Uh, yeah, senators are in Ottawa. And isn't uh, geographically, uh, isn't Ottawa closest to Waterloo, closer than Toronto? That's what I've been told. I might be wrong. Could be either or, I think. I don't know. All right, it's a push. We'll take it as a push. Um, the point is, uh, people I know are both, well, it doesn't matter. The, the real point here for the interview is you need, um, uh, uh, you need, okay, so I'm getting a geography lesson that Waterloo is only a little bit west of Toronto, which I, I appre appreciate, Rustam. But it's also south of Toronto, right? So it's kind of closer. Anyways. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and now we're getting advocacy for all the hockey teams in the world, uh, which is all right. Uh, Swedish national team, that's a stretch, Liger, but we'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, <clears throat> so the, the real point is you never know where an interviewer will go and uh, feel free. Um, uh, they may ask questions that they think are culturally relevant, and that's the key. 
is I could start making up questions uh, given Bilal's history. I could make assumptions about his culture. And I'm not even saying, uh, uh, you know, um, for example, a question I could ask that would be weird for an interviewer, but not impossible is, so are you a Canadian citizen or, or where are you from? Oh, you're actually asking that. Okay. Yeah. You don't have I to answer that, in... by the way, unless you're comfortable. But yeah, I'm but the okay. The point I'm is okay. that many interviewers might ask that. Yeah. Um, I was born in Canada and lived there for, well, I was born in Canada and I moved to Texas actually immediately after. I lived there for 10 years and then came back to Canada. So I have a bit of both worlds in me. Got it. And do you have work authorization in the United States? Um, no, I need a J1. I don't have any citizenship or any other visa. Right. And so that's actually a legitimate question. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the point being either an interviewer or HR may ask you your employment status. Um, what isn't legitimate is like, yeah, yeah, but where are you really from? Like, that's a that's a that's a question that you should just say, I don't think that's appropriate, like in a nice way. Right. Or, you know, you can, there's a lot of ways you can choose. You can choose to say that you can choose to say where your parents are from. You know, you can pick your answer. But if people start to get into things that are off, they're inappropriate, you should draw a line and not be pulled in. Um, so the last question I have for you is you're considering working at Twitch. Uh, what questions do you have for me about Twitch? How can I help you figure out if Twitch is the right place for you? Yeah, um, I guess as an intern, I'm trying to look to broaden my experiences. A problem I found is that a lot of companies kind of do the same thing. They're basically like the standard like JavaScript backend web apps. I was hoping to like figure out what kind of opportunities do you offer interns? Do you let them pick what team they get to be in? What kind of products do you have and so on? If you're at liberty to speak about that. Yeah. So uh, speaking as the easy coach, uh, you know, I'll talk about what I know about what Twitch does. I don't normally talk about Twitch, but I could certainly answer in an Amazon context as well as Twitch. So first, if I were pitching you, what I would tell you honestly is I'd say, well, Twitch is an interesting uh, technical infrastructure. We do a lot of our development in Go. And so if you want to be exposed to something new, uh, we not only uh, work in Go, but we also have several people who contribute full time to the Golang projects. And so uh, while that isn't something normally an intern would have a lot of time to do, we actually believe in open source and we invest in the open source community and we pick up things from open source we think are valuable. So most of Twitch is built in Golang. Um, that said, uh, we aren't always able to let interns pick their team, but uh, what kind of thing, what areas do you think within Twitch, as much as you understand it, is there a piece of Twitch technology or the Twitch problem space that interests you? Yeah, um, I kind of want to apply my C++ experience into doing, I think, more technical things. So whether that be like low latency applications, I don't know if like media streaming would qualify under that, or um, I do have some experience in infrastructure. I don't necessarily know how Twitch integrates with Amazon, like AWS, mm -hmm. um, but that would also be something I think could be interesting for me. Yeah, so as, as an Amazon subsidiary, most of the Twitch infrastructure runs on Amazon Web Services, as you would expect. Uh, and so that's, that's a great opportunity given you have AWS history. So the point for all the viewers is if you have a good interviewer, they will manage their time because they realize they are both uh, hiring and selling. <laughs> Condimenting thinks she just has to be in DevOps. So we're just going to slap a pager on you and, and tell you when, it, when this beeps, go fix it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, more realistically, though, uh, you have the opportunity um, to ask questions. And one of the biggest ways to sync your interview is to appear uninterested, just like being unprepared. If I say, well, what questions do you have for me? And you say, well, none really, uh, you know, Twitch is really cool. And, um, I already know about it or anything like that. You want to have, you want to interview back and not in a hostile or aggressive way 
But what you did was express a desire and ask where that can fit in. And uh, that was good. So honestly, for chat here, I know people said he's a ringer. Um, if this had been a real mock interview, I would absolutely uh, pass Bilal on uh, either for a full loop or, or hire him uh, based on this discussion. Now, a real interview would have a, a deeper coding test, etc. cetera. Uh, Chalupa Whale says he hates the what questions you have for me question. Why? I actually that? love that question because I have like two things I love to hear about. Um, the first question I always ask is like, what do you, so what do you like dislike the most about your company? What could you tell me you would change about your company? And that's always really interesting to hear about. Um, and the other thing I always ask is, um, uh, it's like about culture, I guess. It's like, I've had experience in very bureaucrat bureaucratic cultures. And so I was hoping if you could tell me about whether your company is like that or whatever. Yeah. That's what I ask all, all the time. It's nice. So you gotta, you gotta be, uh, you wouldn't want to accuse a company of being bureaucratic. You want to be a little bit careful on that language. Right. Um, it's totally free to ask. Uh, so how would you characterize your culture, particularly, uh, how easy is it to get things done? Uh, yeah. yeah. so, uh, those are pretty good. So now I see people are jumping in and putting questions in. Uh, there are a couple that are intended to go to you, Bilal, uh, before uh, we let you go off chat. So maybe what I'll do is um, I think we'll see. We'll see how I may have to hide your window, but we'll go ahead and um, pop these up and see how you want to answer them. Uh, so we'll see. Oh, it is going to appear on stream over top of you. So that's fantastic. The first question is, Tell us what your hours looked like at your previous jobs. Sure. Um, at Honeywell, uh, am I comfortable? Yeah, okay, sure. So um, at Honeywell, it was kind of a fusion between startup and big company culture. So uh, during crunch time, it would be like the standard stay like w late after your Friday or, or whatever, <clears throat> or whatever, but it was a standard nine to five job. Um, at the startup that I'm currently working at, it's a remote job, and my employer understands that because I'm a student, I don't have a full-time commitment, so I only do around 8 to 11 hours per week. Um, that's like, out, including a meeting, that's like uh, 7 to 10 hours of development, and yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know, by the way, if people intended me to ask it to you as an interview question. Uh, but let's, let's go with that. If, if you were still interviewing, I said, so Bilal, when you've worked at your other internships, uh, what kind of hours have you kept? What would you say to that? Oh, in an actual interview setting. Um, so I try to follow whatever the company culture dictates. I don't want to be staying very late if the com company is very lax, um, and vice versa. I don't want to be coming in like, you know, at a, at a very, uh, at a very late time compared to everyone else. Um, that was actually some problem I had in my first internship where I wanted to do nine to five. People came in like, like 10 sometimes and so I had to loosen up a little bit, but yeah, um, I try to follow the culture. Okay, I would say that's your worst answer so far, by the way, so <laughs> Liger Box caught you out. Um, uh, you neither want to characterize any company as lax, uh, nor maybe talk about nine to five. Um, uh, now, Crimson here is saying that you need to be first in, last out. That is also not true. Uh, the canonical best answer here that's like uh, no one would ask the question the way I asked it. But what you generally want to say is, well, I plan my time and do what it takes to get the job done. That's like the classic, uh, slightly ass kissy perhaps, but that would be the classic good answer is to... Um, say that you get your, you know, you, you figure out what the project takes and it's okay to be, um, yeah, someone's saying another ass kissy answer. NBA hits says I like to get in a little early to prepare. I am not advising anyone to suck up at that level. You can be truthful, but I think if you do want to be a high performer, what you say is it's about the work, not about the time. So if I were answering this and I were being interviewed, I would say, look, um, I'm about results. 
and I, I am going to plan what needs to be done to get the work done. Now, during most weeks, I expect to do that in a fairly reasonable work week, and I understand there may be occasional crunches. Um, and so, you know, just uh, sharing fun stuff with chat. Um, uh, every year, Amazon goes through a planning cycle called uh, OP1, which stands for Operational Plan 1, which sounds extremely bureaucratic. But uh, we actually, um, uh, we deliver that first to the CEO of AWS, a guy named Andy Jassy. He runs Amazon Web Services, and we're doing that Thursday. And then we'll uh, be delivering it to um, Jeff Bezos in October. So uh, for the last two days, uh, I've been doing work with my team to get ready for our Thursday meeting with uh, Andy. And so I'm doing this stream and then I'll be back at my desk. And that's normal because I'm delivering our entire annual plan to the guy who gets to decide whether or not to fund it on Thursday. So you would expect to work longer in that circumstance. So that's a little off the reservation. But anyway, Bilal, I would try and figure out some answer that says, I'm about getting the work done. It's totally fine to say I don't expect to work long hours all the time, but I also am dedicated to the results when necessary. That's the balance. Now, if that's not true for you and you're like, hey, I have, for example, I have kids in a family and so I need to have predictable work hours. I get my work done, but I have. It's totally fine to say that. And people will generally respect that if you have a reason. Mm -hmm. um, if you just say, well, I like to punch in and out as, you know, as fast as I can, that's a little scary. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. We got a couple more that were intended for you. So I'm going to, um, well, I'll ask my mods here. There's one more that says to Bilal and it's got the most votes. Go ahead and pin that one and we'll ask him that. Um, and so that one is, uh, what are your long-term career aspirations? How does this fit into your long-term prospects? So I think, again, they intend, like, if I were interviewing you, a common question you would get are, so, Bilal, what is your long-term career goal? How, does, how do you see this internship fitting into your career plans? Right now, I would say I'm very early on in my career. And so I'm not really sure what I want to do with my, like what I want to specialize in, whether I want to do a master's or take a, like a startup company or uh, what I'm actually going to do in the future. So I think I'm, I want to use these internships to gain a better feeling of the industry as a whole, different technologies, and in particular, find a company that I like a lot that I might be willing to go to in the future after I graduate. Okay. And uh, what sort of company, uh, what sort of things do you think, uh, from what you know now, I understand you're early in your career, which, by the way, was a good answer. Uh, it's fine to say that. It's truthful as an intern. But from what you understand now, what sort of company do you think uh, best fits you? I mean, I've only had two different co-op uh, co experiences so far, and they've been on the, on the different sides of the spectrum, one being... Uh, a startup, very agile environment, and the other being a lot more established. I find that I enjoy the startup atmosphere a lot more, just because of how much work gets done, and there's a lot less, um, there's a lot less, uh, there's a lot less extra work that I don't necessarily think is productive that I have to do in a startup environment. I think in startups, a lot of more, you get a lot more ownership of the product you work on, and that kind of motivates me a lot. I want to be working on a technology where I feel engaged and uh, wanting to contribute to it. And that's something that I want to find in a company for sure. All right, sweet. So I'm going to take Liger's question in chat because it's on this topic. And then we're going to talk about getting, uh, we'll, we'll let Bilal go and we'll jump into general Q&A because I see you guys are starting to upvote questions. So um, uh, Liger's question was, would I accept an interviewee saying that they did not know what they wanted if it was for a more senior position? And the general answer is no. Someone who's further along in their career, I expect to know what they want. Now, if someone has a really good answer uh, and has thought about it, um, you can easily see someone saying, for example, I've spent the last 15 years as a lawyer I went back and did my MBA and I'm coming out of, you know, an MBA, MBA program and I need to explore where I fit in my new career. That could be a very senior person saying that. 
But uh, someone who's not got some special circumstance just saying, well, I don't really know what I want to do next. I'm exploring is a little weird and scary because they might not stick. So here's what we're uh, going to do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, Bilal, thank you very much for coming on stream and being our mock interview candidate and for taking the random questions for the audience. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Everybody in chat, let's give him a round of applause. He's a long-term community member, Furrow Key, so I'm sure he'll show up in chat as soon as we let him off stream. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do the question of the week to buy a little time. And anybody who's interested from our large pool of viewers, I'll switch over to taking questions about interviewing generally there's a couple in the q a tool the extension we use works on both mobile and on the web um, go ahead and plant those in there uh, and with that below i'll kill zoom and let you go but thank you for your time it's also also always good to meet someone from the community last i will say uh i think uh it I know the guy who runs video infrastructure at Twitch. You told me that you were looking for your next uh, co-op term. Uh, you know, there's a marriage to be made there if you want. So uh, I don't know if uh, companies have to be like in a special relationship with Waterloo for it to be a co-op. No. But uh, I can introduce you to him and make a recommendation because I, I think, uh, you know, is that something you're interested in? That sounds very cool. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, that sounds awesome. All right. So I'll, I'll go ahead and connect you uh, to him and see if uh, I'm sure you'll have to go through Twitch HR and they have their own interview process. But uh, I know uh, there's at least that possibility. And so I'll connect you there and see what's up. All right. So I'm going to kill Zoom. Uh, thank you very much. Stay in chat. Thank you. For everybody else. Uh, where's hang up here? End meeting. Bye. End meeting. Bye. -bye. All. all right, he's out. <clears throat> uh, so that brings us back to us. I can center my chair, get my pesky mic down, get rid of the headphones because I don't need to listen to him anymore. Uh, so, hey, everybody, that was fun. Now let's go into questions, Q&A. Uh, so you guys are filling up the widget. I'll bring this nice and close, make sure I'm loud. Um, you're bringing up the widget. Uh, filling in questions you'd like me to answer. But in the meanwhile, for people who don't know, we have a community tradition here and we have a lot of new people here. So we're going to have a lot of fun with it tonight because we have a big session. And that's thanks to our good friend Devin Nash recommending this show to his audience. Devin was doing resume review on his stream today. He and I are going to get together and do a joint resume review. Um, but in the meantime, uh, he recommended people who are interested in having a better resume uh, Come on over, um, uh, come on over and see the mock interview. And I have to say, I was surprised. Uh, Furrow Key killed it, uh, which was great. I see Devin's here. Uh, yeah, we are going to do a meetup at Twitch. We've been talking about when and where at Discord. I run Twitch Prime, so we're probably going to do it at the Twitch Prime booth sometime on Sunday. Maybe uh, I'm currently thinking uh, two o'clock on Sunday or one or one thirty, like right after lunch on Sunday at the Twitch Prime booth at uh, TwitchCon. For anybody who's there, we're gonna do um, we're gonna do a gathering of the Easy Coach community, the meet and greet. Yeah, that'll be my meet and greet, and we'll do a group photo that we can share here later. So what we do every week for the question of the week is uh, there's this gentleman Arthur Aaron who figured out that uh, if you share personal things about yourself and you have a personal interaction with someone uh, and you start very abstract, the first question on his list is, if you could have anyone in uh, history over for dinner, a li living or dead, who would you want? And you ask that of someone and they answer and they ask it of you and you answer. And then the questions become progressively more personal and what they discovered is by the time you go through these 36 questions with a complete stranger, you'll generally feel like you have a pretty good relationship with them. And it can all be done in about 45 minutes. And the point of the research was to show that by exposing yourself a little bit and being vulnerable 
and sharing a little bit of your personal sort of things that we don't normally talk about, you can invite others into conversation with you and build a relationship. And next week's show is going to be on how to build a network, for example, how and when to network. And so that kind of skill is useful there. So anyway, every week we answer a question. And this week we're up to question nine. And what we do is I answer the question on stream, but I ask everyone in chat to give their answer. So question number nine is, for what in your life do you feel most grateful? So repeating, for what in your life do you feel most grateful? And go ahead and put it in chat. I will answer and say, uh, I'm grateful for a ton of things. I'm very lucky. I have a very blessed life. But uh, I'm most grateful for my family and friends. I have a tremendous wife, a great set of kids. Um, but more than that, I also, uh, my family finds it's, uh, they get a huge laugh out of it because everywhere we go, um, we end up running into somebody I know. It's almost become a joke where uh, Devin Nash is most grateful for memes. I believe that. He is a meme expert. Uh, the first time I was on his stream, I think he spent half the stream educating me on memes I didn't know. Um, which was a lot, to be fair. It was easy pickings. Um, what else we got here? Cosmic Corndog, most grateful for health. The Rex 243, being alive. Um, I am Kibitz, uh, or Let Me Kibitz. Could be either one. Being born in North America, yes. Um, Hephaestus just got here for the question, and he says, for me, it's being brought to the U.S. with my parents when they immigrated. Uh, great answer. Hephaestus runs a startup here in Seattle. Uh, is a great manager, part of our community. I love seeing all the regulars sound off. This is awesome to see all the people uh, each week that come back every week and have become a part of the community. Shadow Fox is most grateful for Twitch. Gave me everything. And I know a lot of Shadow's story. Uh, Twitch really has given her a lot of opportunity and she's done a lot to seize it herself. Um, and I, by the way, my shout out to her. I appreciate all my moderators, certainly uh, Shadow Fox, as well as 40 Pink Dragons. Um, uh, super helpful. Uh, they, they make the channel what it is, as well as we have editors who put up the show we do every week. It goes out every week as a YouTube video and as a series of podcasts. And it reaches many more people than only here live on Twitch through those forums. Uh, one of the great things we started doing last week was having people share their success stories of how advice on the Easy Coach or books that they've learned about here have brought them uh, success. So we bought some time. We have some questions coming in. I'll read a few more of these. Ether Knight says his, his uh, uh, mental health. Um, I hope you haven't suffered poor mental health and you just got it back. Um, but yes, mental health is good. There's a lot of people who struggle with mental health. Um, <laughs> Ligerbox is most grateful for his PhD. Um, I, I thought you were still working on it. Uh, but anyway, he is uh, Dr. Liger, as it turns out, in Singapore. Um, T Weirdo, uh, for kids, family, and friends. Great answer. Um, uh, me, it's uh, being able to think about things most people don't think about. All right, mullet boys, you'll have to tell us one of those thoughts. But I agree, thinking is fun, right? Having the chance to contemplate and dig into things. Oh, oh, you were memeing Devin. I got it. Uh, I was most grateful for your family. All right. <laughs> I wasn't making you look like a douche. I just misunderstood. Um, uh, Kristen, learning what it means to love unconditionally. My kids are teaching me all sorts of things about myself. Yes, well... Uh, kids will teach you what you're willing to walk in front of a bus for. It's for sure. Uh, hyena tacos seems like another meme. We're going to get into is a, is a hot dog, a sandwich here in a second. All right. Well, thank you all. That's a great answer to the question. I appreciate everyone who shares here. Um, we're going to jump in, uh, mods, go ahead and throw up, uh, the top question here. We've got some good questions in our Q and a that'll take us through the rest of the show. And the first question is. How should I determine my starting salary as a recent college grad? 
just pick something on the range stated on various job hunting websites or is there a good method? What should I do if the interviewer uh, asks me how flexible I am, my salary expectations? So this is an answer with all kinds of complexity and I will do my best with it. Um, first, uh, a lot of companies now have a standard, big companies, I'm only talking about big companies, Many big companies have a standard new graduate offer that is not negotiable. I am not certain about this. Uh, sorry, Deflax wants to know where the question's from. We use a question widget, uh, an extension specifically. I'm always calling it a widget, even though I built extensions. So maybe I should uh, have extensions turn, uh, renamed widgets. Um, but uh, it comes from the extension, the Q&A extension, and there's the instructions to use it if you'd like to vote. We appreciate everyone who votes. We're a Q&A driven show. Um, so you're a big help when you tell us what you want us to answer. Going back to the question, most big companies may have a fixed new graduate offer. Similarly, Amazon has a standard intern offer. Um, and as far as I know, that is true of Google, Facebook, etc., Microsoft. They have standard package. If you're in a situation where you need to negotiate, one of the first things you can do is because we hire several thousand new graduates and several thousand interns every year, yes, thousand, that package is well known, it's documented. So even if you're not gonna work at Amazon or Google or whatever, and those are tech jobs, the point is you can get an idea of what the, the job range is and ask for that. I would say when you're just starting as a recent college grad, the most important things, while it's important you want to be paid well, the most important things are where you're going to work. Is it work that you can succeed at at a company you want to be at? Because far more important than your first job than your first salary is can you deliver can you be successful, get that on your resume and get moving in your career. Now, I'm not saying take a job for trash wages, but I would prioritize for a small difference in salary. I would definitely prioritize um, where you're working and is it a good company that interests you where you can put your heart into it and be passionate much more than a few thousand dollars of pay on the fringe. Um, the second thing is, what should I do if the interviewer then asks me about how flexible I am in my salary expectations? Well, if you've asked in range, that would be a weird question. Um, uh, people hiring new college grads are not usually looking for a bargain basement, um, but you want to have a prepared answer to this where you're comfortable and you say something like, well, I know my own value and I expect to be paid fairly for my work and my abilities. However, I'll entertain any offer and consider it in that light. And if there are other factors that make a particular job or type of work especially appealing, I'm open to looking at the total package. Something like that, that basically says, look, I'm not here to be devalued, but look, I'll listen. Uh, and I'm interested in what else you have to offer. So for example, I'll go out on a limb. Um, uh, people find it funny, uh, but people lined up to be Trump's apprentice on the show, The Apprentice. There's a case where, and, and I'm sure before that, there's a case where you're going to get more from the experience than the pay. So you do want to think about, is this a job where it pays me enough to live or to cover my college loans, but I can get the experience I want or value? So an example I've shared on stream before, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the Rex243 in chat here, he copies down a lot of my answers. I, I'm going to have like this little mini me running around Hamburg, Germany, which is fantastic. Um, I hope it serves him well. Um, you'll have to let us know how you do sometime there, Rex. Anyway, uh, I went and interviewed for a job with Elon Musk at SpaceX. And that was a job that, sure, I wanted to be paid well, but salary was not going to be the main thing. 
Um, now, it turns out uh, I wasn't a fit for what Musk wanted. Um, and I shared the story before. It's like my one brush with fame. I actually got to talk to him. Um, but in that job, my thought was, here's a chance to put people on Mars, to put my name in the history books. You're getting a type of value that money can't buy. Now, a company like that should still be able to pay you fairly, but like money would not have been my number one concern. The chance to have an impact of that kind would have been my number one concern there. All right. Uh, Liger wants to know, could you use the question to bargain for other perks? Um, uh, yeah, and there's a lot of, look, there's a lot of things on the, on the table. I'll finish up this answer by saying salary is not the only variable. Vacation time, um, location, team you're going to work on. The question Bilal asked a few minutes ago of do I get to pick what team I work on if I come to your company, what team you work on, what projects, all of these things, what location. Uh, you want to ask for serious stuff. You probably don't want to say like, well, can I get a window office? Um, but uh, yeah, if people want to pay you less or ask that question, again, you can say, well, um, I expect to be paid fairly, but there are a number of things I value. I value working on uh, a team in my area of expertise. I value, uh, you know, I, um, I know you have several locations you're hiring for, and I've always wanted to go to New York or whatever the answer is. So you can negotiate for more. Um, uh, I'm shooting from the hip here because in my field, everyone has the same title and pretty much the same task. Yes, they're doctors. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Liger's job is he's Dr. House. He's an infectious disease researcher. Okay, cool. Uh, I think we've beaten that question to death. Uh, let's drop down to the next one. Um, and I'll start reading before uh, the mods pop it up. There it is. So I had my interviewer talk more in my latest interview than I did because I ask a lot of good questions in the end and his uh, questions were concisely answered by me. Is having the interviewer talk more a good or bad thing generally if you give sufficient answers yourself? So the last clause of what you said is really important. Many people who are gaming an interview would say the more the interviewer is talking, the more you're winning. And if the interviewer wants to go on and on, just nod politely and listen. There's some truth to that, but you have to have done something to establish yourself first. Um, uh, it says he was done in 12 minutes and I was leading the other 30. So it was, it was Rex 243. So the warning sign there, Rex, is... It can be you killed it in 12 minutes, but um, one of the things is if I have a terrible interview and it's clear the person's no good um, or doesn't fit my job, uh, but I'm scheduled for like a 45 minute interview slot till the next person shows up. So I have to kill 45 minutes. So one way some people do that is they'll just start talking. They'll say something like, well, let me tell you more about Twitch. Did you know we have free lunch in the lunchroom? And yeah, we have our own down on our third floor. It's amazing. We have this salad bar and blah, blah, blah. Um, you, there's a difference between the interviewer likes to talk and the interviewer is filling time. In that case, you need to try and rescue the interview. It's good if you're concise and you make a good impression. And you, do want, you don't want to contest the interviewer for control of the interview. But in a case like that, I might prompt the interviewer with something like, um, uh, uh, is there anything else you'd like to know about my skills or background? I want to make sure I share everything you need to, to make a hiring decision. Or make, uh, I want to make sure I cover all of my background so that you can uh, move forward with me in confidence. Those are power statements. That, And then if he still wants to talk, 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 fine. I would say you had a bad interviewer because if I'm picking someone for my team, I'm digging, 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 looking for more data. Even if I have a lot, I keep digging because 
uh, why not? I've got these 45 minutes or this hour. Get as much as I can because I'm going to bet uh, a ton of time and money onboarding you into my team. And if you don't work out, I have a ton of effort to do to manage you first to try and improve your performance and then to move you out if it doesn't work. So I'm going to be all over that. Uh, and so if you have someone who's just blathering, you kind of have a bad interview or they've decided um, they've decided that you stink. And if they've decided you stink, you do have if they're trapped in the room with you, you have a chance to reverse that impression. Um, so uh, it is about being good at thinking on your feet and kind of reading them. Uh, if they do seem like they just want to chat, just engage them and try to without overselling yourself, slip things in and join the conversation. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll jump to the next question. Uh, what are some big no-nos that you see often? I don't mean obvious ones like not showering before your interview. I mean the uh, things you routinely see in the wild. Um, uh, big no-nos. This is a good question. Um, so a huge no, no, I've seen it cost a guy an interview, uh, uh, cost a guy a job is bad mouthing. You don't want to bad mouth a previous employer. Um, take the high road, uh, because here's why, uh, if you're willing to say something bad about your previous employer to me in an interview, I have to assume that a, once you leave my company, you'll be saying bad things about us to others. And B, that you don't have very good uh, discernment about what to say um, uh, and what to reveal. And so, uh, and C, you might be a really critical, hard to please person. So the last thing I want is someone who's griping in their interview, um, griping about their jobs, griping about, uh, you know, conditions. As Condimenting says here, never criticize, condemn, or complain. And that's right. Um, now, that doesn't mean you have to say that your last place was awesome and you loved everything about your last workplace. But if you are asked, for example, let's say you're put on the spot. Uh, what was something, you know, you worked for Apple. What was something you found hard about the Apple environment? Okay, you can answer that honestly. Um, you can also just say, wow, that question's a little uncomfortable. I don't like to speak ill of any previous employer. Is there another way you can get at what you'd like to know? That might be a really, um, but if I decided to answer it, I'd say, well, um, <laughs> Tim Cook stabbed me with a knife. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So if I had to answer that question, like if I was interviewing somewhere else, and someone asked me about Amazon, I would try to be extremely de uh, decorous. And I would say something like, well, all workplaces have challenges and no company is perfect. One of the things I've struggled with at Amazon is that Amazon can be very, very business focused. And in serving our customers, which we love to do, I sometimes don't feel like we're doing uh, that I'm personally able to do all I'd like to um, for a higher mission or more to help humanity. So that might be an answer I would give. Now, I will say, as an aside, uh, Bezos just killed it by putting out the pledge to meet the Paris Accords 10 years ahead of schedule. So I've always wished that Jeff were a little bit more of a leader in that kind of thing. And I'm speaking only for myself here, not for Amazon. I love that uh, he came out on climate. So that's an aside. But I've given you how I would answer um, uh, how I would answer the question. Um, what, so what are some other big no-nos? Uh, eye contact, lean in. Don't, don't be doing this. Like even if you're an introvert, you've got to gear up and be focused and able to engage. Um, uh, complete your answers. Check for understanding. Say, did I answer your question? Was that everything you needed to know? Um, don't over talk. Don't interrupt. 
you can disagree, but don't argue. Uh, there's a long list of don'ts. And I've seen people do all of these. Um, I've seen them look at their phones. Uh, you know, like, by the way, I have had executives, for example, say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, um, my company uh, isn't aware I'm interviewing. Um, and I will need to check my phone once in the middle of our interview. Please excuse me. If you set it up in advance, even though that's weird, you could get away with that. But if you're just picking up your phone and looking at it, like my, what I'm getting out of is you're not interested. Um, don't, you know, again, you said not the obvious things like not showering. Appearance does matter. Um, and, uh, you always want to be just a little bit better dressed than the middle or norm of the company. You don't want to show up at a suit, uh, in a suit at a place that that's all fleece and jeans. Uh, same thing though. You don't want to show up in fleece and jeans at a place that's all suits. Um, and so, uh, when in doubt, dress a little better. Um, there's a lot of famous lunch no-nos, right? Like, uh, pick something easy to eat because you're going to need to talk while you're doing it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Somebody, uh, deflects here says, you know, be neatly groomed. Like this isn't the place to look like duck dynasty for your beard uh wear a beard if you want like that's fine um if you have a lot of tattoos you might consider uh wearing long clothes while you have them i mean tattoos are a lot more accepted but i wouldn't necessarily uh particularly if you have something you know uh unusual as a tattoo i wouldn't necessarily go in flying your freak flag um and yeah lunch is still part of the interview uh talking to the people at the front desk is um, <laughs> hydrate right now. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid by the way, uh, to ask if you need a restroom break or something to allow yourself to be comfortable. Um, all right, let's see what else we got here. Um, okay. We're going to jump to the next question. Is there a way to recover from a bad interview? Um, I mean, not perfectly, right? That's going to be tough. Uh, but there is a way to recover from a bad interview for sure. Um, <clears throat> and the way to do that, uh, and the mods will pop up this question in a second. Um, we're having uh, a little bit of bandwidth trouble here. So if I have to do it, I'll do it. Uh, yeah, we, we got some freezing. I'm not sure what's causing that. Uh, everything died for a minute. Um, so... Uh, I think we got a bunch of people in the house uh, hitting the bandwidth. All right. <sighs> Stuttering for me, but audio is okay. Well, sorry for that. Uh, we may have to run around the house and police the kids or something. Anyway, we're good right now. Seems like we had a momentary hiccup. Um, but... Uh, all right. Is there a way to recover from a bad interview? Yes, there is. Uh, and the way to recover, it is not 100%. But remember, if you're already having a bad interview, it's already sunk. So you got nothing to lose. What I would do um, if I felt I was in a bad interview is I would call it straight up with the person. And what I would say to them is I'd say, this doesn't seem to be going that well. Um, uh, you know, uh, is there something I'm missing or is there a different uh, set of questions that I haven't hit on in my, or, you know, a different set of things you'd like to know that I haven't covered? Um, so if you're in the middle of a bad interview, I would just honestly go ahead and try to find out uh, what's going on uh, because you're in trouble. Um, and I would try and engage the interviewer at a human level and say, look, uh, it seems like we're not connecting and that I may not be meeting the needs of this role. Um, can you help me understand? Because I'm very interested in this job and I want to make sure, you know, if I don't fit, that's fine. So I actually share an example of how I did that. Um, it goes back to this uh, Elon Musk story. So before I went down to interview with uh, Musk, uh, the role I was interviewing for, this is like five years ago, was to be a VP of software working at SpaceX. And I thought, what a cool job. I really want to do that. But um, 
I made a choice a long time ago to focus on personnel management, not to focus on, um, not to focus on uh, keeping my coding skills at the top of where they'd been earlier. So uh, what I did is I told the interviewers, hey, uh, when Musk is looking for a VP of software, is he looking for someone who um, programs all the time, is still programming, or is he looking for a leader? Because I'm the latter, not the former. And they said, oh, a leader, a leader. I sit down with Musk and we have a great talk for a few minutes. And then he says, well, you know, uh, I expect anyone in this role to code at least 10% of the time. And I said, that's interesting uh, because I told uh, your um, recruiters, I asked them if that was something you required or were interested in. And I told them, I don't do that. I focus on leadership. Um, And so I sank myself because I didn't want to be misplaced in the interview. And the point of the story is, um, uh, the point of the story is, I then decided to try and recover it. Um, and I said, you know, I believe it's more, I basically told my side of the story and why I did it my way. And I asked him, so given that, are you sure that this is a requirement from your point of view? And he said, well, that's just how I feel. I really want it. And at that point, I excused myself. I said, okay, well, like I said, I explained to your recruiters, that's not what I want to do. Um, and it's not how I lead. Um, and uh so i think i'm kind of wasting your time and uh with that in mind uh hey scar good to see you here um with that in mind um oh that's funny so for anybody who doesn't know uh twitch scar is bobby scarneman at uh twitch and he and i worked together for a long time and of course he subscribes with twitch with twitch prime so that's awesome good job uh so um that's how I would, that's what I actually did. And then I just shook his hand and left because I figured I'd rather have a great relationship. So is that recovering a bad interview? Well, I stuck to what I believed in and um, I left uh, with a relationship then where to the degree he remembers me or I ever need to interact with him again, uh, he can tell the truth. I can tell the truth that like, hey, I didn't bullshit you, and I was straight up with you that I don't fit what you're looking for in that role, and I didn't waste your time. And for a guy like that, not wasting their time is winning. So did I recover the bad interview? I guess I did. So mods, I'm going to need extra help here. Uh, For whatever reason, um, in the broadcast booth, I've lost my view of the question uh, list, and I can't get the extension to come back up. So extension failure. Um, but I know we had other questions there, so I'm ready for the next one. Go ahead and roll to it and we'll take it. And, uh, hopefully, uh, it's a local problem. Whenever we had the delay, um, it just went away. Um, so when it pops up here, uh, we'll go on from, is, is there a way, um, so I'm waiting to see if we have enough, because I know we had other questions loaded. And if not, mods, all right, here we go. Um, how do I get a company to help reimburse my tuition? Uh, two ways. At a large company, they'll have a tuition reimbursement program. Um, and you can just ask. Uh, you can just learn the terms of that and apply. At a small company, you're going to have to negotiate for it, because they're not going to have a standard program. And this goes along with everything about comp. We talk about this a lot of times. For the people uh, watching who haven't heard it, um, uh, something like 70% of people have never asked people get something. So this comes down to negotiation. Uh, If you need to get uh, reimbursed, uh, it's probably about asking. Um, So I froze here again if you guys are having frame problems. Uh, Yeah, so most people don't ask, and those who do ask, most people get something. So if I want to get my tuition reimbursed at a smaller company, I'd 
I always say this, we talk about what I call the magic loop of how to perform, which is uh, do something useful, then go ask your boss, how can I help you? Uh, then when they tell you, go do that thing and do it well, then you go ask for tuition reimbursement. You do not come in the door and ask for it. You can if you're negotiating for a new job, by the way. You can say, do you have a tuition reimbursement program? Uh, I'd like to see that as a part of my, um, uh, um, I'd like to see that as a part of my compensation. You can say that, but if you're already at a company and you want your tuition reimbursed, do it after you've delivered some value. Go in on a high point and say, hey, I'm working on my MBA or uh, now they're not going to go reimburse your, your tuition from after like you. If you already got your degree and it's three years in the past and what you mean was, will you help me pay off my student loan? The answer is no. But if you're working through school right now, you can certainly ask. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I would imagine there is a huge selection bias for the 70% raise statistics. Say more, Furrow Key, what do you mean selection bias? That the people who don't ask uh, also aren't qualified? or Because I just think it's introverts. Um, uh, no, you cannot, you cannot generally ask companies to pay for education that's completed. Um, what you can do is ask them to pay for education you're undergoing, particularly if that education is relevant to what they do. But even generally, a lot of companies will invest in your self-improvement. And there's a reason for that. If you think about me as a leader, I have two employees. One person wants to go to school to make themselves better at something, even if I think it's irrelevant. And the other person is, as Devin would call, if he's still here, a potato. Um, I would rather pay for your interest in getting a master's in art history, which I have no idea how you would use, than for you to be a potato. So uh, I'm going to be more interested in leaning in behind the motivated person who's trying to improve themselves than leaning in behind the potato. So uh, tuition reimbursement works in the favor, even if you're getting educated in something unrelated to the job, because it shows me... Uh, uh, motivation. All right. Um, the people who ask probably super deserve it. The people who don't ask probably know they won't get it anyway. Ah, so some of that is true for okay, but a lot of people, particularly women, um, turns out, uh, are hesitant to ask. It's, it's, um, there's a gender bias as well. And who's willing to ask and who's willing to make a request. Um, and so, uh, that's your hypothesis. Um, all right. Uh, so let's see. The next question is for a question as general as what's something that's very challenging for you. Uh, would you want to focus on a technical experience or something more personal? Um, I, uh, so this refers back to the interview we did, uh, with Bilal Furrowkey here half an hour to an hour ago. Um, and uh, I asked him that question. I would say I would always first focus on something job relevant. People who are interviewing you about for a job want to know what you've done in other jobs. So if you're technical, it could be a technical challenge. I would not talk about a personal challenge unless that was your best idea or unless you had a really dramatic personal challenge that could relate to workplace accomplishment but I would not normally do that. Um, uh, and yeah, Hephaestus, who pays people himself uh, and runs a startup says, it's too easy for employers to delay giving raises until people ask. Yes. Um, unfortunately, the squeaky wheel gets the grease uh, is an old saying. It's a true saying. Um, I'm going to try getting my extension to load again because it's pissing me off. It's not. Um, but uh, I would talk about some. Oh, there we go. See, so just refresh. Come on. OK, looks like we may be out of questions. Nope, we got a couple more. Great. All right. So I'll make this plug. We're long into the broadcast. We've done our 90 minutes. My dinner's waiting. So we got 70 viewers, which is a huge number. If you haven't, and we have a couple of our all-star viewers. 
So uh, Scar's come in, we've had Devin in, and we have all of our regulars. So if there's more stuff you want me to answer, you've got to give it more than one vote. Somebody's got to make a little differentiation here. And I'll answer the next thing that's got at least two votes in uh, the Q&A extension. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I mentioned earlier that our next broadcast, I already said, will be, uh, I think it's next, it's Tuesday, October 1st, and we're going to do how and when to build a network. So we're going to talk about networking. Um, and yeah, if you haven't joined our Discord, Shadow Fox uh, just popped up our Discord. Uh, we're arranging our TwitchCon meetup at Discord. Uh, so probably um, Scar will be there, I assume. Bobby, are you going to be down? I'll be stunned if you're not. Uh, we'll try and see if we can't get everyone to come uh, hang out uh, for a little bit uh, at the um, Twitch Prime booth. There's going to be some surprises at the Twitch Prime booth. I'll just say... A gaming company that hasn't, that normally has no convention presence and doesn't normally attend cons will be there. Uh, where are you going? Are you going to TwitchCon, buddy? And then you can do the Easy Coach Meetup. Um, haha, there we go. Oh, he's got a frowny face. Um, all right, let's see. Um, what else? Oh, so always follow us on YouTube and Twitter. Um, good job voting up some questions. I'll jump in those next. And the last thing I'll say to everyone here, um, uh, if you haven't followed the channel, please do so you can come back and see us um, because uh, I'm only able to broadcast about once a week due to my work schedule. So I need you to follow so you get the notifications when we're going live. Um, <clears throat> and the last thing is please invite others. If you've enjoyed this show and gotten value out of it, um, we grow through your recommendations and referrals. If people can't attend live, uh, can't watch the live broadcast, point them to our YouTube channel, which gets a ton of views, and we want you there. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right, so you're... All right, Scar's going to stay home. Well, that's sad. I was hoping to catch up with you. But I get it. I will uh, catch you. I'm going to be in San Francisco at Twitch HQ... Um, a couple times in October. So I think uh, my EA should already be pinging you about dinner. So check in on that. All right, let's hit these questions. Mods, pop up the one of the two three-vote questions. We'll answer those and wind up the show. Meanwhile, though, I appreciate uh, all you do, all the fans do to refer people in. Um, so how would you answer this tricky question? I only do the tasks I am assigned. Uh, whoever put this in, jump in and chat. Uh, I don't follow it. There's no question there. How would you answer this tricky question? I only do the tasks I am assigned. Uh, chat, feel free. Let's have fun with this. Theorize what the hell does the question here mean? You all voted for it. Um, I only do the tasks I'm assigned. Like, that would be a terrible thing to say. If you're busy saying I only do the tasks I am assigned, I think uh, that's bad. Um, so, uh, wonder what this means. Um, yeah, I would never say that. It's like a questionnaire thing. I only do the tasks that I'm assigned. Um, it's not part of my job description. Yeah, people have heard my rant about the guy who said it's not part of my job description. So forever put this in, I'm just not sure what you mean here. Um, uh, but um, you should never say this, uh, I don't think. Um, so um, if uh, um, uh, I would, I would, I mean, if that's how you feel, you can definitely get a job and I would recommend you get a job, you know, at a moderate company um, in a big bureaucracy where that'll be normal. And it's mostly about pushing paper around. But if you want to be a top performer, which is what I believe about most of the folks who watch the Easy Coach, never say this, right? You're, you're trying first. It's not about what you're assigned. You're focused on the work that needs to be done and trying to figure out what that is. Uh, and second, um, you're always looking for what's the highest value thing you can do. 
Actually, I'll mention this as an aside. I just updated the Easy Coach schedule on our website, um, and it's pushed out uh, all the way to like January. Everything we'll be talking about, uh, I'm sure there'll be a few changes, but every session is scheduled until January. And one of the things I'm going to do um, uh, is do a session on urgent versus important and how to basically differentiate between what your quote unquote is signed and what's worth doing. Um, and there really are times, I'll give you a teaser. You can Google this guy named Brad Porter. He's an Amazon distinguished engineer and he wrote an essay called Selective Negligence. So if you look up Selective Negligence by Brad Porter, I'm pretty sure you'll find this essay on how he ignores bad assignments, basically. Um, I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. Um, and you should do the same thing. So I got to move, move this and see if I can find it for you real quick. And then we'll stick it in Discord if we can. Selective Negligence Brad Porter. Uh, this guy is one of my peers, and uh, I think it was put on LinkedIn, it looks like. Uh, he wrote it on LinkedIn uh, several years ago. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, I'll pop this up. It'll be over my face for a second. I'll lean out of the way. So, um, so yeah, you should read this. And that's a free teaser for what I'll talk about later. But, like... Uh, he basically talks about how to how to know when to ignore stuff. All right, we're off topic though. I'm gonna roll to the next question. We've we've given enough time to the imponderable question I couldn't understand. Um, I'm gonna read chat real quick and just see uh, if anybody else made sense of that question. Oh, if that question's on the questionnaire. Oh, I get it now. Uh, God, I would say no. I only do what I'm assigned, even on a, like first, that's the truth. And second, on a questionnaire, I'd say, no, I only do what's assigned, which was the wording. All right, we're moving on, but I would say no. Uh, yeah, strongly agree, neutral, disagree. I would disagree strongly with that. Um, okay, so uh, how do you approach and or start talks about a salary or raise negotiation when you've already been working for a company for a while? So I kind of covered this already, but I'll cover it again. We have this uh, little video um, out on YouTube called The Magic Loop, and I recommend you read it uh, or watch it. The Magic Loop, I think as I characterized it then, had five steps. And the five steps are do your job well. After you've done your job well, go ask your boss what else you can do. How can I help you? How can I make your life easier? How can I meet the company's goals? Your boss will say something. Unless it's impossible or unethical, go do that thing and do it well. Don't ever go ask your boss, how can I help you? And then say, ah, never mind. Like, now you're losing. Uh, yeah, read the video. Well, it's got subtitles. No, it doesn't actually. Um, then uh, go back to your boss and say, okay, I did that thing. Um, hey, I'd really like to learn about or develop my skills in this other area. Is there any chance you need something done or is there a stretch project that would grow me in that area? And so you change from just asking them what do they need help with to, hey, is there a way I can uh, help in a way that grows me also? Um, and I'm willing to do whatever you need always, but is this a possibility? And then uh, hopefully if you have a good boss, the fifth step is they give you that project that stretches and grows you in the way you want and you go do that. Raises. You do them after step three or after step five. You do them either after you've asked them what they need done and you've done it, or you've asked them if you can do something that stretches and grows you and you've done it well and have a success. Then you just go straight in, uh, hopefully with some comparative data of your worth, but you say, hey, I'd like to have a discussion about my compensation. Um, you know, I've been working hard here. I've tried to bring a lot of value to the company and I want to understand how I can grow my value so that you'll be able to pay me more. You always line it up as I'm delivering value and I'm dedicated to making this company succeed. What do I need to do so that you will be able to pay me more? Right. What is the um, uh, 
Um, how often should you wait for the next loop once you complete one? Not long. Um, I mean, even better is to go into your boss like the, okay, now we're going to go for like the bonus round of the magic loop. Even better is to go into your manager and say, so I've been observing our business and our team. And what I've noticed is that blah, blah, blah needs done or seems like it needs done to me. Is that something that you think uh, you'd like me to work on or is there something else you need more? Um, there's different ways to phrase that, but I have this observation. And what you're communicating is, I'm thinking about this and I'm not putting all the burden on you to figure out what needs to be done. I'm willing to figure it out myself. And so that's like, uh, if the magic loop is good, that's like playing at the pro level of the magic loop, which is making suggestions and then being willing to see them through autonomously or do whatever they think is more important. All right, great question. Uh, the rest of salary negotiation is um, knowing what you're worth and being able to give some data to support it and being willing to leave if you can be paid more elsewhere, uh, you know, and you're not being compensated fairly. That said, comp is not the number one thing in life. It's super important, but uh, having a boss who supports you so that you can um, not hate your job during the day uh, can be, you know, how many of you ask this? If you have a bad boss right now, how many of you would give up 10% of your salary to have a better boss? And probably a lot of you would say, oh, I, I would because being miserable 50, 60 hours a week is way worse. Um, so, all right, last question. We're going to do the last question of the night. It's the last one in Q&A, and then we'll wrap it up. I appreciate everyone who's been a great audience tonight. Niche question. What is a good way of telling an interviewer that you want to travel a lot with the job? Um, yeah, there's tons of good ways to say this. What you phrased here in the question is not one of them. Um, you turn it into a positive and you say, um, uh, you know, I'm in a situation where I'm able to travel and I know some jobs uh, require a lot of travel. Um, since travel is a positive for me, is there a place in the company where I could be valuable because I'm free to travel? That's like the killer positive way to ask for a high travel job. Um, now, most particularly, there's a lot of people who don't want that. Um, so you're going to be a hero to some because, uh, road warriors are rare. And if you want to be a road warrior, uh, you know, that's just one more qualification, um, where a lot of times managers are afraid, like this, this role involves some travel. Are you going to be okay with that? All right. So that's everything. Uh, I'm sure my dinner's getting cold downstairs and the mods are getting tired. Folks, it's been fantastic having you all here. Uh, appreciate it again. I'm going to go to TwitchCon. I guess I'm not going to see Bobby Scar there. That's that's big and sad for me, but I'll catch him later. Um, join our Discord. We'll do a TwitchCon meetup, and then I'll be back on Tuesday, uh, October 1st, after TwitchCon. We'll talk a little bit about TwitchCon experiences, I'm sure, and then we'll do how and when to build a network um, because you always uh, – uh, oh, hey, Rurp, thank you for subscribing at Tier 1. Appreciate all the subs. Um, all subs go to support the Washington Trails Association, and they may soon go to support, by the way, the new branding of the channel. One of our uh, common viewers, one of our frequent viewers has been helping me. Uh, we're going to get some new overlays so that uh, faces don't appear over each other, etc. So we're working on that. It'll come out in October. Anyway, everyone, thanks a lot. I love you guys. It's, it's great fun to have a community that's so engaged. And I love asking the good questions in chat, uh, seeing you uh, pop up with answers and input and help people like Bilal and share your success stories. So I will see you all in a week. And until then, good night. Cheers.